another episode of Page Turner. Today is uh, Wednesday, February 17th. This is episode number, guess which one, guys? 36. 37. 37. I said 37 before we started rolling, and <laughs> Aaron wouldn't say. So, yes. Ep episode and it's not just February 17th, Karen. It's Ash Wednesday. Well, I was going to ask not you. Not a rodent that can symbolize it. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> Bunnies, no groundhogs. Listen, ashes. I did go to CVS to try to get you guys Ash Wednesday cards. They don't have any. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no Ash Wednesday card, you know. You're yeah, dead. No. You're I think I think Lent is one of the seasons of the year, almost like Advent, that is really, it defies commercialization, I think. It's, it's hard to commercialize. I guess we're going to get into this. You'll be dead soon. Uh, so repent of your sins. <laughs> Drink and be merry. <laughs> that's, no, that's not what Lent, that's not the message of Lent. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> well, we are going to get into talking um, about Lent in a little bit. Um, but we were just talking earlier about this cold spell that we're having with the weather and in the whole country, actually. It's crazy when you... Um, look at the weather map and see the um, temperatures and actually we're kind of like right on the cusp but like Texas got hammered mm. millions of people without power and freezing and it's crazy um, so our prayers are with them and then um, Kevin mark your count you probably already know tomorrow let's do you know what tomorrow's what's happening tomorrow not a rodent day I know that that's when the <laughs> Mars thing is landing right yes yeah. yep so amazing rover, another rover landing and uh, that was launched back in july so it takes you know like we said like that show it takes like eight months to get to mars but i didn't realize there were already five other rovers on mars mm -hmm. yeah so but this it's is really a marvel if you if you if you research how they uh conduct the landing of these instruments and these machines i mean the precision with which to execute it is it's really a profound uh well again it's, it's a profound testimony to the genius of the human imagination made in the image of god this is a part of our expression of, of being made in the image of god it's true you know we, we we can create and our minds want to know the truth beyond just ourselves we want to go infinitely into the beyond to know what is the cause of every little thing. We're never, we're never satisfied with the effect. Oh, this has happened. No, we want to know why it happened and how it happened, which leads us to say, well, how did that happen? Which leads us to say, well, how did that happen? We want to seek the cause really of, of everything. It's, it's, it's wired into us. And of course, the great mystics, the saints, the theologians would say, well, that's because we're ultimately drawn to the ultimate cause behind all things the uncaused cause, which is God. And only when we have union with the uncaused cause will our knowledge truly be at peace. So there you go. Sorry, you lost me at the very end there. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It started sounding like that. Our quest for knowledge, our quest for knowledge will reach its ultimate end. You just sounded like, uh, what's her name from that White Man Can't Jump movie when she said, sometimes you win, but you lose, and sometimes you lose, but don't win. Or it just I got kind of caught up in that. I apologize. But that's okay. I didn't even know we we're going to talk about that, so it gave me another, uh, gave me another avenue to sow confusion into the minds of our hearers. Yeah, but I think we'll never be satisfied, so we're always going to be trying to find the. Well, we, well, we we will we will be satisfied once we have the acquisition of truth itself, and God is truth, capital T itself. Everything within our finite created world are truths, and every truth lowercase t participates in the uppercase t truth and that's what we're ultimately seeking that's what we are pursuing and truth of course is outside of ourselves so the truth that we want is not within it's without um, and ultimately it all participates in um, the wisdom of god john would say john's gospel the logos who became flesh and dwelt among us the the, the wisdom the mind of god the truth of god that's what we want hmm. I chuckle because yesterday Shane wrote something in an email to us and said something about the divine logos, and I I read it as divine Legos. So. 
But you're right, Karen. I mean, Paul does say we see through a glass dimly right now, and we're you know. But on the other side, we'll 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 know everything. So yeah, we will we will know God as God knows God. That's ultimately what our uh, purpose is: is to know not God from a natural, empirical, abstract form of of knowledge, but to know God as God is, His essence, and um, that in in itself will be the full satisfaction of the intellect's capacity for the infinite. I think she fell asleep. Yeah, yeah she did. Yeah, that's, I, 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 that's, I fell asleep. that's fine. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> but, I'll, I'll mention this on Sunday. How about I just paint my sermon all about this on Sunday instead of, uh, perfect. Instead of Satan. <laughs> the first <of> the event. <laughs> Well, if anybody is interested in watching the Mars landing, I think it's you can watch it on like a YouTube channel or space station or something. I think it's supposed to land at like 3.55. So. In the afternoon? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no way I'm going to see it in the morning. Shane will have to tell me about it if it's in the morning. Uh, yeah, I will have just had my first cup of coffee. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Are you PM or AM? PM. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, if it was AM, you would You'd have you, to tell us. Yeah. yeah, I would have just gotten up. So wrong. So it wrong. Is. It is. <laughs> um, so going into today's topic, I guess we're going to finish up. Um, we just finished reading The Apprenticeship with Jesus, and you had your last sermon on that on Sunday. Um, it, it, was, it was a good book. Um, yes. I, I thought it was an easy read. I mean, it, he, he was very, I guess, entertaining. He had some really good stories and some good way, you know, made it relevant, easy to see his point through his stories. Um, I don't know how deep it actually was for me. I didn't feel deeper, but I felt, um, and I liked his activities too. So, and that was part of the reason why I was reading the book was to actually have some action items that I could do with a book study instead of just doing the study and then moving on. And you touch on that in your sermon, Shane, too, about mm -hmm. what do we do next and how believing in Jesus is not enough. We have to let him live his life in us and conform us. And, and mm -hmm. you touched on that in your sermon and then talked about the scripture reading with the fisher with the fishermen and casting their nets deeper and letting Jesus cast your nets deeper into Jesus. So yes. And that we can go as deep as we want. Um, and let me go back to your point about you like the exercises. Well, I'll tell you why you like the exercises is because we are embodied creatures mm -hmm. and we engage the spiritual through our bodies. And we can't really grow in our faith without getting our bodies involved. We are not just like the uh, Greeks believed souls encased in a body. We are embodied souls. Uh, our bodies and our souls are united. And so we engage this, uh, the soul very much through the materiality of the body. That's why you enjoy the exercises because it was doing something to you. What, one of the things that we have to avoid in the Christian life is the heresy of quietism. Quietism is simply the belief that, well, I don't have to do anything. And, uh, the spiritual life, the will of God will happen apart from my cooperation. Nope. We have to get involved. And that's why uh, an experience of worship is always at its best when you're in the space. We'll have to get to that some other time. In the space, standing, sitting, singing, engaging the sacraments more than just thinking. Because we are not just thinking creatures. We're emotional feeling creatures too. And so Part of what you will need to do to go deeper is let, we're in the season of Lent. We'll get into that. Observe a holy Lent. Do something that involves your body. So that's why I think you like the exercises, Karen. Well, yeah, because I feel like, you know, when you normally, you, like you were just saying, we go to worship, you listen to the sermon, you leave there feeling inspired, mm -hmm. then you just don't know what you're supposed to do. Like, I feel like I'm left with all of this information but I don't know how to apply it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. And I even feel that way now with just, um, with, with religion, I feel like hearing sermons, reading, being engaged, praying, 
Like I'm on this plateau here, but then my life is over here. And mm. I don't know. I'm integrate that. Yeah, I don't know how I'm supposed to like, okay. you know, like I leave church and then I come home and I'm parenting. So how do I, how do I be? Ah, well, see, you're compartmentalizing the two. Kevin Teller, uh, go ahead and straighten her out. <laughs> I was going to say, we have to have a whole nother episode on this. This is, yeah. this is rich. I love it. Oh gosh. Well, I think Shane's right. Compartmentalizing. And I think that would be, um, think about the prayer of St. Patrick where, you know, we say Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ inside me, all those, you know, we can make fun of it, I guess. But this idea that you want to have this, I think that's what Shane's been saying for the last five weeks is an integrated faith that when you yell at your kids, you've you got the mind of Christ in you. As, as ludicrous as that sounds, because that's probably where I feel le the least Christ-like when I'm yelling at my kids to go do their online homework. Uh, but to get to that point, that's the goal, right, Shane? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, well, that's, that's the only thing we can do. Um, don't ever discount the daily responsibilities that we all have to face and to do them with faith and integrity and doing it for God. So, you know, yeah, you come home, you parent, but how can you now parent in Christ? And, and love your children in Christ. Um, it's really that. I mean, if you want to discern the will of God, we always tend to project out, you know, what's what's God's will for my life, 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 you know, and he just kind of goes into this void. No, no, no. What's the will of God in this moment? God's will unfolds in the very present moment of the now. Like now it is God's will for us to engage in this conversation. Well, let's do it well. Let's do it honorably. And so if you can focus on the responsibilities that you know you have as a parent, as a spouse, as a music director, as a pastor, do all those small things well, and God's will will unfold. You will have enough grace to really step into his will for you tomorrow. And that's why Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Forget about that. You know, focus on the graces of today. And you do that through your daily work, through your daily parenting, through the daily drudge, and doing it. Mm -hmm with Christ, for Christ, and in Christ. You're making me think about when I was dating Cindy before we got married, and I was trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to get married? And I read this book, and they said, um, we tend to only ask God for help in decisions that are big. Should I move? Should I change jobs? Should, where should I go to college and get married? And this author said, you know, we need to do this and ask for God's direction and all the little things. Like, where am I going to lunch today? Yes, and of course, our model for that is Jesus himself. Remember, he was a carpenter. He, he went to work. He was a, a blue-collar laborer for far longer than he was a pastor preacher, um, and he did that work faithfully, you know? So every measurement he took, um, every stone he carved, he did it with excellence. In the time for his mission, which did begin, well, it unfolded in a natural supernatural way it was it was his supernaturalization of the natural that helped him unfold the will of god i mean i'm not trying to put just put words in our mouths and, and in our minds but just think about how faithful he had to be in the daily drudge yeah sure and that's what led him into ultimately his mission but he didn't anticipate his mission before it's time that's what jesus was so good at it's not my hour right now it's not my hour right now my hour will come but right now I'm engaging this person in this moment. It's a great lesson for us. Yeah, and I, I know too, when I'm in the midst of parenting, you know when you're, when you're, in, you're, you're, you're yelling at your children and your mind, you're saying, I wish I didn't have, to, why am I being this way? Like why, mm -hmm. you know, like you, there's something in the back of you that knows like, okay, this is not, probably the right parenting method at this moment yeah but yeah it's, it, it, Wait, yeah uh, last comment i'll make i cannot remember uh well his last name is hard for me to pronounce anyway he uh he said like if you're a christian and you're in your workplace that every christian ought to be the best employee in the entire office we ought to be the best in everything the most honest with the most integrity because we're supposed to do everything for God. Uh, and I think that's great. You know, it's just a lesson to say, yeah, the, the little stuff that we do that are charged to us, do it with excellence because God is an excellent God. 
What's that little short book? It's so good. Brother Lawrence. Is that oh, yes. Called? Practice of the Presence of God. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So his thesis was uh, our experience of God in the sanctuary should be no different there than it would be in the office. Yeah. Now, that, but some people will take that off the deep end and say, well, that means I don't need to go to church or worship. That's great. No, that's not what he's talking about. It just means that God is the God among us at all times and in all places and in all seasons. Like he's washing dishes. Compartmentalization. There's no compartmentalization. Like in the, he's washing, he's a monk and he's washing dishes and he's washing them dishes for the Lord. And he, he's, he's washing dishes for the Lord. Right. Short, short. You should read it if you're listening to this. It's really. You can, yeah, read, you can it. read it in about an hour. You can yeah. read the whole thing in an hour if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. What's it called again? Brother Lawrence's practice of presence. Practice of the presence of God. I'll put the link in the, I'll put the yeah. link in our email. I'm sure it's online. You could even read it online. It's, it's oh, been around wow. a while. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can well, read you know, it. Since, you know, since Karen opened up the podcast with a criticism of the book that we were reading, mm -hmm. um, if there's one thing that, if there's one thing that I would wish he would have expounded more, and maybe my listeners will get this, when he speaks about being in Christ, clearly biblical, clearly in the New Testament, well, don't abstract that. I mean, I think he came at it from a very spiritual standpoint. Well, what does it really mean to be in Christ? Well, it means to be in his body, the church. Hmm. And how do we immerse ourselves into Christ? Well, not just through a spiritual intellectual activity, but through the sacrament of Holy Communion. So I really wish he would have put more flesh. You know, I, I know that sounds corny, but I wish he would have put a little bit more flesh on his understanding of being in Christ. It's never... We're never really in Christ apart from his body, which is the church. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I mentioned that to Reverend Diane, and she says, yes, that seems to be a common fallacy among a lot of spiritual writers. I mean, they get it in so many ways. They're very good. But then we do tend to abstract the application of our spiritual life when Christianity does not traffic in abstraction very well. It's incarnational. It becomes flesh, physical, going back to our original point, activities in, that are in the body. I liked your sermon, too, when you were talking about um, the laws, the spiritual life law, and that mm. it's a vertical plane and that you're either advancing or you're regressing, like mm. tossing a ball up. You're either going up or down. Right. And I, I, that that was a little eye opener for me because I'm like, ooh, sometimes I think I'm on pause. You can't be on pause <laughs> in the spiritual life. <laughs> yeah, I think I put it either you either going deeper or floating to the surface. Um, that, that's just, but that, we all have that struggle. I mean, the, the whole point is, is that well, do you desire God today? We ought to be desiring God more today than we did yesterday. We should be growing in grace more today than we did yesterday. We should be loving our neighbors better today than we were yesterday. Charity, love, the virtue is infinite in its expansiveness. And um, we want to be set in motion, in the motion of charity, which is always the expansive. And when you stop, it begins to, to contract. So, you know, wake up every day and just simply desire God. That's so critical to the spiritual life. Do I want God more today than I did yesterday? That's an exercise of the will. Which means, you know, what that means is that we're in control of our depth. You know, that's kind of the point is it's up to me and to all of our listeners. We are the ones who get to determine how deep into God, into the mysteries of faith, we truly want to go. Kevin, do you have anything to add about the sermon on Sunday or, or any? Yeah, Would Kevin, you... tell me about the sermon. Yeah, well, Kevin. I did find fault with, though. I like the uh, idea that love was the only virtue that doesn't, well, you were saying they had to find that golden mean, everything else. Like, yeah. you don't be too much this way or too much this way, but you can love extravagantly, love recklessly. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, th that was a very interesting point. I never thought of that before. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, Aquinas and some of the scholastics that love should always be in the extreme form. I love that. That's, see, that speaks to me. We can't love God too much. Mm -hmm. Um, Kevin, are, were you any comments on the book? I thought it was a great segue into Lent. I mean, I really think it it, it, it was a good way that, that um, Pastor Diane and Shane set us up for Lent. Yes. To practice. Now, this is, you know, Lent is the big, gigantic, uh, you know, lab experience of this book. We can practice all these things. 
Sure. Which segues well into our next topic, which is Lent. We are so good at this, Kevin. 37 episodes. <laughs> um, yeah, so today kicks off. It's the, the kickoff to, to Lent. And um, you guys, um, I guess, well, Shane, you have been talking about it quite a bit about be thinking about what you're going to give up, what you're going to give up. So I have, and I'm off to day one, three yep, hours. Day one, we've got six start. weeks to go. Uh, and it's really important to do something specific. I mean, think of something specific. If, if I know that I have found it in my experience where I thought, well, I guess I might give up this or that. I don't know. It never happens. So it has to be uh, specific. Um, and that's really what I'm encouraging everyone to do. Um, and of course, the whole point is not I am I am currying favor with God. That, that's not the point. The point is, is that I want to configure myself. I, I want to share in my Lord's sufferings for me. Um, and that way I can, I can draw myself deeper going back. You know, I, I, I want to deepen myself into the very suffering of my Lord who for my sake and my salvation denied himself completely, utterly far more than we could. So I will deny myself. It's just a small way of sharing in my Lord's suffering for me. And it's really, I mean, I hate to say it, it's really only 46 days out of the entire year. Right. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's 46 days. It's when you put it in that context, it's really not that, I mean, really not that hard. <laughs> Talk to me it, next week. <laughs> and what I love about it is that it's the one season of the church year that you can feel. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're really participating in it. You can feel it. You know, uh, I've, I'm, I've, we're not divulging what we're, what we're sacrificing for Lent. Um, but am I going to feel it? Yeah, I will. <laughs> That's good. I'm excited. My daughter and I, she challenged me. She said, if I do this, will you do this? So she init initiated the challenge to me. So my daughter, <laughs> I think my daughter and your daughter were talking. She oh. didn't challenge me, but yeah, but she, she's not going all the way in with her she, she's just reducing she's oh. not eliminating <laughs> well but you know if it's for her if, she, if that's something she's going to feel go go for it she'll yeah. probably feel it <laughs> we, we told isaac that he needs to give up minecraft and he was like mm -mm, no 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 no, no. He, uh, so, but that, that's kind of the point of the uh, the fasts of, of Lent is to demonstrate, wow, I'm really mastered by these other things. I'm not really in control. Because once you're able to say, no, I, I can't do it. Well, something's got more power over you than it needs to. And we should not want any created thing to determine our response. You know, we, we want to be completely given over to, to Christ who's not of this world and um but fasting will really expose wow it'll it, it'll expose what you're addicted to <laughs> i um i was remembering i was looking up doing some research for today and lawrence do you know lawrence holstucky oh a yes famous worship guy um and he wrote this thing he said lent is not i'm thinking about giving up chocolate people say i'm just giving up chocolate that it's not a temporary life altering, but it's a spiritual exercise to um, that alters us. And I thought, oh yeah, that's great because as a musician, like I still I practice this morning. I still have to practice. I didn't stop practicing when I got my degrees. So it's not just a temporary thing of giving up chocolate for forty six days, but hopefully in that, then I'm going to be able to continue this. Not necessarily maybe chocolate or eliminate or whatever. Yes, and, 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 and of course, the, the spiritual masters of, of Christianity constantly talk about the virtue, of, well, not the virtue, the absolute necessity of detachment. Hmm. Uh, we, we need to be detached from the created goods of this life. Why, why? Well, that brings up one of the other themes of Lent, and especially the theme of Ash Wednesday. We're going to be dead. And when, you, when you're dead, you're not attached to anything anymore. There's only God in that moment. And um, we want to kind of die to ourselves now so that there's no withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> I guess you could say when the soul goes to heaven, 
uh, there's not going to be any apps in heaven. There's not going to be any chocolate. It's just going to be God. And, and we want we will want to have gotten to the point where we only desire God. Yeah, we're not really, I'm not really concerned about these other things. I'm not attached to them. So fasting, whatever you're giving up, it's a form of detachment. Also, I like that we're not disclosing what we're giving up because I saw somebody say on Facebook, I got so many people saying that, goodbye, I'm off Facebook for Lent, you know. Someone commented and said, it's like a person running into a bar and saying, I'm going off the, you know, I'm going off drinking to a bunch of drunks, you know, like it has nothing to do with that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, so Ash Wednesday is, is really, it's, it's fascinating. Even the, it's the kind of day that you would think nobody would want to be in church or would even think about it because of the somber nature of it. When we impose the ashes, we say, from dust you came to dust you're going to return. You're mortal. And yet more people find so much meaning in that act than they do some of the other um, ceremonies within the church. It's, it's fascinating to me. Well, you know, we always have the youth sing. And they're singing. This is actually the last time the youth sang in worship was a year ago. So it's uh, oh, for Ash Wednesday. Pre-COVID. Uh, sorry? Pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. And so tonight they're singing. Uh, and, and when I started that, you know, 22 years ago, it, the youth usually rehearsal Wednesdays, it was a very purely logistical, very, um, I don't know what the right word is here, but it just made sense. They already come on Wednesdays, just sing a service, but they've grown to love it. They really, they like it. They like going up and getting that cross and, and we discuss what it means. And, and I think it's because it draws us closer to truth. You know, we started the podcast, uh, unexpectedly, we're talking about truth and uh -huh. well, it, it's an exercise in truth. And what I mean by that is it's the, it, it helps us. It's the most humble day of the year. It's the most humble. Humility as a virtue is not like, oh, I'm just weak. I'm no good at this. That's, that's not what humility is. A humble person accepts and loves the truth of reality and accepts reality as it is. Most of us, we're propagandists in our own way. We never really do, uh, confront our own reality. Like when we've done something wrong, we always blame somebody else. You know, we never like search our truth. But what's the truth that we say today? You are mortal. That's reality. There will come a day when you will not be here on this earth anymore. Well, the humble embrace it. It's an, it's an embrace of, of truth. That's what the humble do. Pride, of course, hates to confront its own mortality. So the prideful person does not want to talk about it. Uh-uh, I don't want to, de because that's a denial of reality. So I think when we come to an Ash Wednesday service, it has meaning to us because we are participating in the truth of reality. And that's good for us. It's good for us. And it goes back to your point about being embodied. We go up there and do something physical. Right. Yeah. I like it too. I like, I like Ash Wednesday. Why do you think they... When you think about it, why do you think way back, why did they start Ash Wednesday? You know, like we celebrate the death, we celebrate the resurrection, we celebrate his birth. But why do you think they started? Like, what was the reason behind it? I mean, we know now today, but it's kind of, you know, why? Well, I mean, it's not biblical. Jesus doesn't say you have a, a Lent. Yeah. But, 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 but I think 40, 40 has, the, you know, 40 days has this biblical theme going through it. You know, the, the flood yeah. was 40 days. Moses lives at, where was Moses for 40 days? Up on the mountain, is that right? Up on the mountain, yeah. Um, Elijah, same thing, 40. Um, the Israelites in the wilderness. Yeah. And so for 40 Jesus years. Go, go, yeah, 40 years. And then Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days. And that's really, what I think, where we get that. But it was a time of preparation for new converts to become Christians. And so they spent this time set apart to prepare themselves for, and they would get baptized and received into membership on um, Easter Sunday. And much like if you've ever been in a fraternity or sorority where you could go as a new convert to worship and hear the preaching, but you'd have to leave. You weren't allowed to have the sacrament of Holy Communion until after you had been baptized and been received as a member. So yes. and it was that nasty drink. I can't imagine it being good, milk and honey together. Oh, 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 oh right. Well, you know, the, the, all the, the whole point of the liturgical calendar is that we are participating in the life of Jesus. 
is to get you to participate in his very life. You're following his life. And remember, we don't traffic so much in days, like one day. Remember Christmas, we think of it as one day. It's a season. Lit now is a season where we are now participating, sharing with the Lord in his journey to the cross. Um, because Easter is approaching, you know, and, and, and we, we want to travel with Jesus in his suffering and passion to his cross. This is another topic for another podcast, but I think it's important for our listeners to know that when it comes to the work of our salvation, it's not the resurrection. That's not the definitive moment of, of, of the work accomplished. Easter Sunday is the vindication of what happened on Good Friday. That's when the work of our salvation truly obtained is when Christ reconciled us to God by taking upon himself the sins of the world. So it's the cross, the cross in our participation in the cross um, that really, in, in Christ's cross, that really affects our salvation. Easter was simply God vindicating the work that he did on Good Friday. That's, also, that's the difference. I think it's also cool for Ash Wednesday. You know, it's in the middle of the week. Right. So, you know. Inconvenient. Inconvenient time, right? You have to come on a Wednesday night and go to church. Oh, in the same with Holy Week, Thursday and Friday of Holy Week. You have to make a special effort. It's not part of your regular routine. I think that's very important mm. as well. Yes. Yep. And so we want to travel with the Lord uh, in, on his path of humility and self-denial and so the liturgical calendar lit is meant to help us do that. Kevin, speaking of liturgical calendars, have you yeah. ordered any for confirmation this no, year? Actually, I just wrote it down yesterday. I have to order them. The little the, wheel calendar, you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, even though it's the same, it changes every year. It's, it changes. It reminds me of, like, the Chinese New Year's stuff. <laughs> like the, doesn't yeah, it? But, yeah, but there's no fortune cookies or anything with a liturgical year calendar. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I will say one last thing about the liturgical calendar. How how many days is Lent? 40. 40. 40. Well, it's 40, 40, but 46. 46, but if you if you take away the Sundays, it's it's 40. Uh, how many days are in the season of Easter? Do you know? 50. 50. What does that tell you from a liturgical standpoint? What does it tell you? Well, it tells you. Well, go ahead, take, take a guess. <laughs> take a guess. Easter's more important. I don't know. Well, no, well, well, to the extent that it vindicates uh, the work that Jesus did on his cross, what it shows you is that the church is actually more about joy hmm. than it is about sacrifice. And we have completely reoriented it. I remember I preached a sermon on Easter Sunday morning. It was a sunrise service at Myers Park. And one of the things I said is like, you got 50 days of joy in front of you now. And the church in the in the in the past actually commanded 50 days of joy. Like you couldn't be sad and melancholy for 50 days. You had to be joyful. And someone said, came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I'm so good at being miserable during Lent, but when you said 50 days of joy, I don't know if I can pull that off. <laughs> and, you know, and it, it but it's true that what we should actually have more extended periods of joy. Yeah. Than we should misery, but we associate Christianity with, oh, you know, we're so good at the sacrifice. We're so miserable at the joy, and we've got to reorient that. And if you and if you practice a good Lent, Easter joy will be exponentially higher. Absolutely. And some and some churches they don't kneel during Easter and they don't confess sins during that fifty days mm. as a recognition of what's been done for us. Yes, yes, uh, I do know that. Um, um, in the Orthodox churches, uh, Easter is the first from Easter Sunday for the next eight days is considered to be one day. And you're like supposed to party every single day. But anyway, we're, we're talking about partying during on, the, on Ash Wednesday. We, we can't get there yet. But nevertheless, you know, uh, the, the joy, the seasons of joy are longer than the seasons of penitence. Sure. Well, speaking of Ash Wednesday, so for those that are watching this earlier on Wednesday. We will have a service tonight um, at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, and it will also be live streamed on all of our channels. So um, you can watch if you are done watching us and you want to come to church, because <laughs> I think this goes out at five, so you'd have some time to get to church. Um, and then, yeah, and then I guess just practice your, you know, enjoy being in Lent, <laughs> suffering. Yeah. Yeah, and do it, and, and do it, and, you know, find something, stick to it, make it specific, 
be consistent. And when Easter comes, it'll, it'll really be so much more joyful. So um, it's kind of weird. I was, uh, I was talking with Brian yesterday, I think, about our upcoming Easter services and stuff. And it's like, oh, last year we pre-recorded all of this. So I'm kind of glad that we are almost back to not normal, but we're going to have in person during Holy Week. We'll be able to have all of our services in person and um, not be... It seems like it was a lifetime ago last Easter, doesn't it? Like, mm. oh my gosh, like that it's been a long year. <laughs> it's been one long Lent at, at time. That's a, exactly what it feels that like. way. <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, um, and then any other announcements? I guess it's just still missional impact days are going on. We have a couple of um, book studies happening that you can check out on the website. And um, yeah, same old. Yeah, yeah we, of course, by the, by the time our viewers uh, see this or listen to it, uh, I'm getting ready to head out to do some imposing of ashes uh, through the drive through And <laughs> as an offer, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, I will say that as hard as it's been this year, it's really caused us to exercise some creativity and to do things we normally would not do. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Kevin, you want to show the the, the stick that they're going to be? I don't have one. Uh, oh, I thought you oh, you don't have one. I just showed a pencil. It's a swab. Oh. Yeah. There, I said it. <clears throat> swab. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll be using swabs. I, we, I, honestly, I have no idea how well this is going to work, but we will impose ashes using uh, longer Q-tip swabs. And um, <laughs> yeah. they teach you that in seminary school how to how to do all that. I was not taught how to do that. Mm -hmm. All my friends at my previous appointment, uh, my lines during Ash Wednesday services got shorter and shorter. And my associates line of people got longer and longer over my four years because I would spackle their foreheads. Uh -huh. People would say, it took me five hours to get you what you put on my forehead off. <laughs> you know, so uh, I won't be able to, to smudge with a, the degree of thickness that I normally would. <laughs> Not this year. <laughs> Uh, well, good luck with that. Are you doing it too, Kevin? Are you smudging? No, I have to go up to Statesville, so I've got to do that. So, oh, you got to be back. I know. Okay. Th yeah. Thanks for reminding me to be nervous about that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> well, I will see you guys later tonight at at, um, at church for the service, and then we will be back, the three of us, again next Wednesday for episode 38. Everybody take care and have a great day.